It has been nearly three years since my last Plex installation tutorial, and in that video I was just running the plugin inside of FreeNAS. Today I'm going to show you how I actually run Plex in my house, inside of a virtual machine on Proxmox with an NVIDIA graphics card passed through for hardware encoding. Let's get started. Today's video is brought to you by Lexar and the NM610 PCI Express NVMe Drive. Available in 250GB, 500GB, and 1TB capacities, it makes the perfect upgrade for your laptop or desktop PC. Featuring NVMe 1.3 Gen 3x4 and speeds up to 3.5 times faster than SATA, it's the surefire way to supercharge your PC. Get into your games faster with the Lexar NM610 NVMe Drive. Click the link down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. You'd think after spending 10 years as a virtualization admin that I would stop confusing the terms Intel VTX and Intel VTD. But it is a mistake that I do make often enough, including last week when I reviewed the Hive Zeus server right here. I claimed that this server does not support PCI Express pass-through, and, well, I was completely wrong. The server does support Intel VTD, which is direct to I.O. for PCI Express, which means we can run a Quadro card inside of a Plex server and enable hardware encoding. So if you hadn't caught on already, that is the plan for today. I'm going to walk through the installation steps for getting Plex installed as a virtual machine on top of a Proxmox hypervisor, and then we're going to pass through a PCI Express card to enable hardware encoding inside of Plex. Let's get this thing started. So we're starting here with a brand new installation of Proxmox and the NVIDIA card not installed in the server yet. We'll get to that in just a little bit. First step is actually getting Plex installed into a virtual machine. And for that, I'm gonna use Ubuntu Server 20.04. First step is to upload the Ubuntu Server ISO into Proxmox so we can use it as an installation disk. So I'm gonna click on my Proxmox server right here. We're gonna go down to the local storage pool, click on content and then go to upload. Content type is going to be an ISO image, then we're going to select a file, and in my case it is in my downloads directory, and I'm going to go over to the Ubuntu 2004 server ISO, and hit on upload. Once that image is uploaded, we can go ahead and get started. So we're going to right click on our Proxmox server and go down to create VM. I'm going to give the virtual machine a name of Plex-P400. Why P400? Well, I'll be installing a Quadro P400. For the installation media, we're going to click on the ISO image pulldown and then select the Ubuntu server ISO, then click on Next. For system settings, go ahead and leave everything at the default and click on Next. Our Plex storage library is actually going to be remote on a file server for this particular virtual machine, so I'm actually going to drop the disk size down to just 20 gigabytes, as the only thing we'll be storing is the OS itself. Under CPU, I'm going to go ahead and give this server four cores, click on Next. Under memory, we'll go ahead and give it four gigs, so 4096. Click on Next. We're going to leave Network Settings as default, so click on Next, and then click on Finish. Once your virtual machine has been created, go ahead and double-click on the virtual machine icon to bring up the VNC window, and then power it up. It should auto-boot to your Ubuntu server ISO, and we can go ahead and get the installation started. Just a couple of steps to get everything up and running. First up, I'm going to select English as my main language because, well, I don't speak anything else. I'm going to continue without updating the installer because we will be updating all of our packages later. Uh, US keyboard layout sounds good to me. Network setup, I'm going to go ahead and use DHCP for now. So go ahead and click on Done. We're going to use the entire hard disk. So go ahead and uh, make sure that is selected and then go down and click on Done again. This screen just shows you how it's going to partition the drive, and if everything looks good, go ahead and click on Done again, and then click on Continue to apply the settings. Most of my virtual machines have a username of administrator, just out of old habit, and this server's name is going to be Plex-P400 again. Username, I'll do the same thing, administrator, and then I'm going to enter my root password. Right here, I am going to select to install the OpenSSH server, as it does make it easier to install all of the packages later on. So go ahead and check that box and then click on Done. We don't need anything else to run in here, so go ahead and skip all of that and then click on Done again. And now it's just a matter of waiting for Ubuntu to finish installing. It's a good time to kick back, relax, and uh, enjoy your beer. Once Ubuntu has been installed, it's time to start working on the Plex side of this equation. To do that, I'm going to SSH into the Ubuntu server, and we're going to enter a couple of commands to add the Plex repository to Ubuntu. You can use any client for this, but I prefer PuTTY, so we're going to enter the IP address of the Plex server. In my case, it is 192.168.1.186. 
I'm gonna enter administrator as my username and the password I entered during the setup. Next up, I'm gonna go ahead and split my windows in two because we're gonna be copying and pasting some commands. In this tab right here is the Plex support forum and it is how to enable the repository for Linux distributions. I'm gonna go down here to the Debian based installations and I'm gonna select these two commands and copy them over. So first up, select that, right click and copy. Click over on your SSH session and just right click and it will insert that command. Do the same thing for the second command right here. And there we go. And to install Plex, it's as simple as typing in sudo apt install Plex Media Server and hit enter. And yes, we would like to install Plex Media Server. Once Plex is installed, I would also recommend doing a sudo apt upgrade to make sure all of the packages on your server are up to date. However, for the purposes of this tutorial, I'm just going to skip that part. And if you've done everything correctly, we should be able to open a new browser window, enter the IP address of our server, so 192.168.1.186, colon 32400, and then slash web. And our Plex server is up and running. Once we've confirmed that Plex is up and running, it's time to connect to a network share so we can start loading in our media. And doing that is pretty darn simple. First up, we're gonna run sudo nano forward slash etc forward slash fs tab. fs tab will automatically connect your Plex server to a network share as soon as it boots up. Getting it all set up is very straightforward. First up, I'm gonna enter the path to my network share, which is slash slash 192.168.1.226, which is the IP address of my TrueNAS server, forward slash Plex test. After that, enter a space, and then we're gonna say, where do we want the network share to be mounted on our local file system? In this case, I'm gonna do forward slash Plex Media, which will mount this at the root of our file system. Space, network share type is a CIFS or Windows-based file share. Then I'm going to define the username and password to connect to the share with. So space, username equals Plex test, comma, password, equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's only the password for my test Plex user. Don't actually use that password. Two last things is space zero and space zero. Hit control X to exit, Y to save, and enter to save your changes. Next up, I need to create that directory at the root of our file system so the network share actually has a place to mount. So sudo mkdir to make the directory forward slash Plex media. There we go. After you've saved the FS tab file, go ahead and reboot, and if you've done everything correctly, it should automatically mount your network share into the Plex Media directory. To verify that, I'm gonna type in cd forward slash Plex Media, and I'm gonna type in ls to show the directory contents, and you can see the movies folder that I've added previously. Now that the directory is on the server, it's time to actually add our media into Plex as a library. So we're gonna jump back over to our web browser, click on settings, scroll all the way down to the bottom, down to Manage, and then click on Libraries. Up at the top of the screen, click on Add Library, and here is where you select what type of media you're adding to your Plex server, whether it's movies, TV shows, music, photo libraries. In this case, I'm gonna click on Other Videos as I'm just adding craft computing videos. Reason being, I don't want any copyright issues on this video, and as I'm the copyright owner of everything for craft computing, I'm not going to strike myself. If you're happy with your choice, go ahead and click on Next. Then we're gonna browse for the media folder. I'm gonna make sure I'm at the root of my Plex server by clicking on the forward slash right there. Scroll down to the Plex media folder we created earlier and then click on movies. Click on add and then click on add library. Now this will automatically start scanning the library for any media that it can add. So we're gonna go back to our home screen. I'm gonna click on the other videos library we just created. And as you can see, it's already starting to add in some of the videos that I've put in there. Again, for the purposes of this tutorial, we're gonna pretend that each one of my cloud gaming server videos that I've added to the server is its own movie. So now let's go ahead and see if this thing works. All right, the video is indeed playing and is streaming what it looks like at 4K. But let's go ahead and verify that by looking at our server activity. So if I minimize this video and leave it playing still right there, I can go up to the activity button right there, click on that, click on dashboard, and right here you can see all of the media that is currently streaming off of your server. And to verify what's actually being done, I can go over and show details. Right now we can see that it is playing in 4K via H.264 Direct Play. 
Jumping back over to our Proxmox view, you can see that it actually takes about 6 or 7% of our CPU just to stream this video without any transcoding at all. But what if we don't want to use all of that bandwidth? Or for example, you have something like a smartphone that you're streaming to, and you don't necessarily need a 118 megabit video being streamed to it. Well, we can go ahead and force a quality setting up here in quality, and then under home streaming, I'm going to uncheck use recommended settings, and we can set a maximum bit rate that we would like to stream at. I'm going to go ahead and select 10 megabit, 1080p, and then click on save changes. Now, if I close this video, go back to home and open it back up, all right, the video has started playing again, and it is noticeably a little bit softer on my screen. I'm going to go ahead and minimize the video again, go back to my activity dashboard, and here you can see the video is still 4K H.264, but now it is being transcoded down to 1080p H.264. And since we have no onboard decoder, this is actually using the CPU to process that. Now, while it is streaming just fine, we can go over to our Proxmox monitor, and you can see that all of my four cores are being hit pretty darn hard. In fact, uh, we're seeing about 95% CPU utilization just to transcode this one video. The fans in the server have also very audibly ramped up. So if you're going to be relying on CPU transcode, you can see it is a pretty heavy workload for CPUs that don't have built-in encoders. Now, unless you're happy with your CPUs running at 100%, anytime you need to transcode your videos, it's a good idea to add a hardware video encoder. In this case, we're gonna be adding an NVIDIA graphics card with NVENC on board. And if you're not sure which model to choose from, I will have a full list down in the video description. Essentially, if your CPU does not have a hardware video encoder on board, it is just brute forcing the codec down to a more reasonable bit rate. However, having dedicated hardware, like an NVIDIA card or Intel's transcode built into KB Lake or higher CPUs, you can do it much more efficiently and at much lower power demand. To get started, there is a little bit of legwork we have to do on the Proxmox host itself. So go ahead and shut down your Plex Virtual Machine and let's get this thing rolling. To shut down the Plex Virtual Machine, I'm going to type in sudo halt p and enter my password and down it goes. Typically, when I do tutorial videos like this, I try to make it my own steps, my own process. However, when a fantastic guide already exists, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. And I found the perfect guide for this. Over on Reddit about a year and a half ago, a user named CJ Alas posted the perfect step-by-step -step guide to getting PCI Express pass-through working inside of Proxmox. And we're simply going to go through step-by-step -step in his guide. Again, if you want to follow along on your own, I will have that linked below down in the video description. The first step I recommend is logging into your Proxmox server via SSH, because we're going to do quite a bit of copy and paste work. Now, one word of caution, SSHing into your Proxmox server. You are logged in as root, so anything you do just happens. There's no confirmation boxes to check or anything like that. If you hit enter, the change is made. First up, we're going to scroll all the way down to the very conveniently named step one. This is where we're going to enable IOMMU inside of Proxmox. So we're going to type in nano forward slash etc forward slash default forward slash grub and hit enter. I'm going to scroll down to the line that says grub command line Linux default equals quiet. Here I'm going to type in Intel underscore IOMMU equals on. And if you have an AMD based Proxmox server, you'll type in AMD underscore IOMMU equals on. We're going to hit Control X to exit, yes to save, and enter to confirm the file name. With that saved, we're going to type in update-grub to actually apply those changes. Step two is loading a couple VFIO modules needed for PCI Express pass-through. So again, we're going to type in nano and then go to forward slash etc forward slash modules. We're going to copy and paste these four values right here. So copy that, scroll down to a new line, right click to paste. And then Control X to exit, yes to save, and enter to confirm. Step three is just another bit of copy and paste. So we're going to copy these two lines right there, paste those in, and hit enter. Step four is where we disable Proxmox from being able to load the drivers for whatever graphics card we happen to be using. In this case, an NVIDIA graphics card. Now, if you've already installed your graphics card into your server, this is the part where you need to reboot so you can unload the driver from Proxmox. However, this is the part where I like to stop, shut down the server, and actually install the card. So to shut down Proxmox, we're going to go over to the Proxmox window, click on our server, and then go to shutdown. That server has been on in this room for two hours, two and a half hours. I've been working on this and doing a couple of other things. 
man, that gets to you after a while. With the server booted back up and the video card installed, there's only a couple more steps before we can pass it on to our Plex server. First up, we're gonna type in lspci-v into our SSH terminal, and we're gonna find our NVIDIA graphics card. So in my case, again, I have a Quadro P200, and it is showing up right here as an NVIDIA GP107GL Quadro P400. You're gonna to wanna to take note of this number right here because that is what is required for the next step. So 82 colon zero zero. I'm gonna go back down to the bottom. I'm gonna type in lspci-n-s and then 82 colon zero zero. And these two hex values right here are what I need to enable this card for PCI Express pass-through. So I'm gonna copy this entire string of text right here paste that in, but I'm not going to hit enter just yet as I need to modify these two values. So under the IDs equal, we're going to do 10DE colon 1CB3, put a comma in between them, 10DE colon 0FB9. So those are my values for this particular Quadro P400 your values are going to be different. So make sure you're paying attention to what the hex values are and what command you're actually entering in. I recommend you triple check this one more time just to make sure those hex values are correct. And if everything does look good, go ahead and hit enter. We're gonna type in this one last command right here. Close my SSH window, cause we are all done with that. And we are gonna reboot our Proxmox server one more time. Once Proxmox has booted back up, it is finally time to PCI Express pass through our Quadro card into Plex. So we're gonna go over to our Plex server. I'm gonna click on hardware, and then we're gonna add a new piece of hardware, and we're gonna add a PCI device. Under the device pull-down menu, scroll down until you find your NVIDIA graphics card. And again, there's going to be two devices. There's the video card itself, and then the audio device. I usually make sure I pass both of them through. So with the GPU selected, hit add, and then I'm gonna add that second device as well. Scroll down and grab 82.00.1, which is our audio device. And click on add. Now, fingers crossed, we should be able to start our VM. Whew, and there we are. If your Plex server does not start up or starts up with an error, you likely missed a step earlier on. Go back to that list and make sure you go through each step one by one and make sure everything is entered properly. All right, home stretch. Go ahead and SSH back into your Plex server. I'm gonna log in as administrator once again, if I can type it in correctly. Administrator, there we go. Go ahead and run a quick LSPCI just to verify that your NVIDIA card is showing up. In this case, it's showing up under devices 10 and 11. So there's my VGA controller, Quadro P400, and NVIDIA audio device. Lastly, we need to install drivers for the NVIDIA card. Now, the way I do this is I go to the NVIDIA website, I find my card in their list. So in this case, we're gonna go NVIDIA Quadro, NVIDIA Quadro P400. We're gonna select Linux 64-bit. And I like doing the Linux long-lived driver, which is essentially the long-term support driver. Go ahead and hit search. Now, instead of just downloading this package and then transferring it over and da-da-da, we're just gonna wget it into our server. The command for that is wget https followed by a very long string of text, which I will not repeat here, but it's the string for the NVIDIA website and the download location. However, the important bit is right in here, if I can find my cursor. Uh, it is the version number right there. So 450.80.02, and then down here in the file name, the same thing, 450.80.02, which is the current version on the website. I will have this as a copy and paste string down below if you'd rather do it that way, and I highly recommend doing that. So we're gonna go ahead and hit enter. It's gonna download that file. And hopefully there's just one more step before we can actually install the driver. You see, there's an open source driver that Ubuntu will use by default called the Nuvo driver. I think is how you pronounce it. I'm sure someone will correct me. To see if the Nuvo driver is indeed running on our server, we can type in lspci-v, go down to our NVIDIA card, which is again right here, the Quadro P400, and we can see that the kernel driver is using the Nuvo driver. Now, we need to install the NVIDIA driver so NVE and C can actually be enabled. So we need to disable the Nuvo driver first. Luckily, there is a pretty easy way to disable it. So we're gonna copy these two lines right here, which essentially add the Nuvo driver to a blacklist inside of the kernel, preventing it from loading. 
And again, these will be pasted down in the video description. We're gonna update one more time. And now, hopefully, reboot one more time. Reboot it and logged back in. Let's go ahead and run ls pci b again and see. All right, kernel driver is not running. With that sorted, there's only two more commands. I hope, I promise. Uh, first up, we actually need a couple of library packages so the NVIDIA driver can actually compile itself. So we're gonna paste in this command right here. We're gonna install those. And finally, we can actually run the NVIDIA installer. And we do that by typing sudo period forward slash and then the NVIDIA package we downloaded earlier. The NVIDIA installer completes pretty much automatically with just a couple of prompts in between. And now finally, we can type in lspci-v and you should see that your P400 or whatever NVIDIA card you're using is now using the NVIDIA kernel driver. Now, depending on which NVIDIA card you went with, you might be good to go right here. However, we do need to make sure the NVIDIA driver is actually working on this card. So if I type in NVIDIA-SMI, that's the NVIDIA driver tool, you can see in my case, it says that GPU 10 has an unknown error where it should list the Quadro P400 and the current utilization. This is essentially the same thing as a Code 43 in Windows and any fans of virtualization and PCIe pass-through know that NVIDIA doesn't like to pass through to a virtual machine. Some of the higher end Quadro cards, the P4000 for example, has no problem at all passing through to a virtual machine, but even Quadro cards like the P400 do block that access. So we need to fix that really quick. So first up, I'm gonna shut down the Plex server. I know I said one more reboot, I lied. Next, I'm gonna SSH back into my Proxmox server. Next up, we're gonna navigate to etc slash pve slash qemu dash server, and we're gonna modify the 401.conf file that's in there. Now that is the VM ID of my Plex virtual machine. So nano 401.conf. Down here under CPU, you can see that I haven't configured a CPU type. However, we're gonna give that host, and we're also gonna enter hidden equals one. This should block the virtual machine from detecting it's a virtual machine and let the NVIDIA driver actually run. So I'm gonna hit Control X, yes, and enter to exit. And now let's fire that machine back up. All right, moment of truth, NVIDIA-SMI. That's what it should look like. And finally, after all of that work, it is about darn time to enable hardware transcoding inside of Plex. Now again, as a reminder, you do need to be logged into the server, you have to have the server claimed, and you also have to have a valid Plex Pass subscription. So you do need to pay the monthly fee or have a lifetime subscription. So we jumped back onto our Plex server. I'm gonna go up to settings. I'm going to scroll down to transcoder. And down here, these are the two magic buttons. Use hardware acceleration when available and use hardware accelerated video encoding. I'm gonna click on save changes. And now we should be able to play that exact same video as I did in the intro, only this time with hardware transcoding. I'm gonna go ahead and minimize that again. We're gonna to go to our activity monitor. And there we go, 1080p H.264, but hardware transcoded. Scrolling down to our real-time metrics here, you can see that we're averaging right around 10 or 11 megabits of total bandwidth for the server. And down here under CPU, you can see there was a little bit of a CPU bump when we started playback of this video, but now again, we're hovering right around 5% for Plex Media to actually stream this video. And that right there is essentially the difference between transcoding with a CPU and transcoding with a GPU, where a CPU has to hit it with basically brute force, versus the GPU which has dedicated video encoding hardware and is able to do it without breaking the sweat. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions with this video. If you have them, make sure to drop them in the comment section below. And on your way down there, make sure to like this video and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Float Plane. Links are also down in the video description. Thank you all so much for watching this one. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys.
Today's beer is from Fort George Brewing Company in Astoria, Oregon. It is their Magnemonious IPA, a seasonal release clocking in at 7%. A little bit more lemony than I remember it being in years past. Yeah, that's quite a bit different from the last couple of years that I've had. Um, normally this is a very, very hoppy IPA, but it's very piney. It's very pine tree-like. Uh, it's what a lot of people accuse gin and IPAs of tasting like. Uh, this year, it's it's sapphire gin versus aviation, whereas last year's was sapphire. Very, very pine needle intense. This year is aviation. It's a little bit on the, the fruitier, lemony side. You still get kind of that general hop flavor, but uh, it's a lot sweeter and a lot lighter. Pine Sol, Lemon Pledge. This is still a quite good IPA. Um, it's not quite as Christmassy as it was last year. Like I said, it's missing just a little bit more of that pine taste. This is still very piney, and uh, there's also some unfiltered yeast in this one. So uh, it's piney, it's very, very intense. So this is not for your entry-level IPA drinker, even though it is only a 7%. This right here is a quintessential over-the-top Northwest IPA. And I still say that even though it is toned down ever so slightly from the last couple of years. It is still very, very enjoyable. Uh, just an overall solid IPA, even if you're not looking for a Christmas-themed beer. Now, this is a slightly longer shoot than normal, but to all the people who ask, do I get drunk every single video that I shoot? No, it's been two hours. 